When I was a kid growing up in the 1960s and 70s, we had real toys, like this handy Andy tool set, for example. Let me show you. These are smaller versions of real tools. A hammer, a metal triangle, a real saw, a real small drill. And this is a miniature working hand planer, sharp blade included. If you got hurt using a toy like this, your parents didn't sue the manufacturer. In fact, you probably got grounded and your friends gave you a nickname. You whack your thumb, they call you stupid. You cut off your right hand, they call you lefty. Stupid, ain't he? <laughs> Look who's talking. Get out of here. It was a different world back then. And we're going to visit that world as we look back at a lot of toys from the 1960s and 70s. Welcome to Alley Picked. Mousetrap. This has got to be one of the most recognized games ever made. It was so popular that they made other games based off of Mousetrap, like this. The Crazy Clock Game. Have you ever seen this one? <laughs> instead of catching a mouse, the goal is to get this guy to jump out of bed. But instead of me just talking about it, let me show you. This is a well-designed game. Just like Mousetrap, it's more fun to just set up the pieces rather than to play the actual game. The game is played by distributing all the cards to each player, then taking turns adding pieces until the whole thing is built. After it's built, the person with the crazy clock card gets the first chance to set the contraption in motion by winding the clock, which triggers the boxing glove to punch the broom, which then hits the cat in the butt, causing him to drop the ball down the steps and through the door knocking the umbrella into the wheel with the shoes on it. The wheel goes downhill, hits the ball, down the chute, knocking into the clothesline, which is on a spring, causing it to fly up and hit the bird, releasing the ball, which drops into the bucket, spills out onto the pool table, hits the sign. The candle on the other end of the sign swings around, burning the sleeping man's feet, causing him to jump out of bed. And now with the game assembled, let's see if we can get it to work. Toys during the 1960s and 70s were different, but I think that the bigger distinction is that we were different. We didn't have technology, we had more patience. We had way more personal interaction with our friends. During the summer months, we'd play with them from morning until night and then probably end up spending the night at their house without a screen being involved. Often we played baseball outside, softball, pinners, 500, fast pitch. We even played baseball using a deck of cards. You split the deck in half between two players. You deal three cards off from the top. If you get an ace, that's a base hit. A two, a double, a three, a triple, a four, a home run. Any other card is an out. You play nine innings just like regular baseball. Now, if this wasn't enough baseball, we might play a game like this. Computer baseball. However, there's no computer involved. This thing uses a complicated and well-engineered set of gears to simulate a baseball game. Let me show you. This is a baseball pinball game. It keeps track of runs, hits, balls, strikes, and outs. Flip the spring lever and see where the ball lands. The small metal ball lands in one of these slots to determine whether you get a ball, a strike, a base hit, a double, a triple, a home run, or an out. If you do get a hit, the picture of a base changes to that of a man's head, indicating you have someone on base. If you get four balls, the lever releases and you get a man on first base. Get three strikes and it drops the balls in the strike slot and moves one ball to the outs section. Gears and levers keep track of all the action. After you get three outs, just clear the balls with a couple of levers and it's ready for the other team to play. This is quite an engineering marvel if you ask me. Toys didn't need to be complicated like the crazy clock game or a computer baseball game. Often it was the simple things that kept me busy. It might have been a spinning top or a cap gun or a ray gun like this. These plastic ray guns would shoot these spinning discs into the air or if you were in your house, it would stick to the ceiling for several seconds. In fact, I think this one still works. Let's give it a try. 
It's surprising that the spring inside of this hasn't broken after all these years. Proof that cheaper toys back then were more like good quality toys today. A lot of toys when I was a kid centered around money, like this change dispenser, one that you would see on a bus driver collecting fares. In fact, I think I remember the bus cost 25 cents and a transfer was 10, but he would use something like this to dispense your change. I remember running around with one of these clipped to my belt, dispensing change to anyone I could find. Kids were encouraged to save their money. When I was about 10 years old, my Aunt Mary opened up my first savings account. She deposited $5 into a passbook account, which meant that you would get a book, something like this, and it would record all your transactions and then list out your balance. You might also get this at the bank. This is a dime saver. I found this at an estate sale. It's actually from the same bank where I had my very first account. I also found a picture of an older coin saver from 1918 from this same Hoyn Savings Bank. Speaking of banks, I had a bank that looked like this when I was a kid. It looks like a mini vault. For security, it has this combination lock. And I was never worried about losing the combination because it takes about five seconds to break into this. And since I had two older brothers, this was not very secure, which is why I had Hoyn Savings and Loan. Get ready for a 1970s game of rootin' tootin' marble shootin'. This is a fun game for one to four players. It doesn't appear to be in production any longer. Perhaps because it shoots marbles, I'm not sure. You prepare your weapon and set the game up by putting a tray of five marbles in each corner. Load a marble into the chamber and begin firing through the opening. The object of the game is to shoot two balls through each of the two holes on your side, striking the bell in the center in the process. The first person with four successful shots is the winner. Now, if you knew me and my friends, after playing this game inside, we would have taken the guns outside for a game of cops and robbers. The last game on my agenda today is from 1964, and frankly, it was nothing but trouble. Trouble, like a lot of games from this time period, always pictured a nice family on the cover that looked like the Cleavers. Game instructions printed on the box. There's no QR codes to scan. The object of the game of trouble is for each player to move their four pieces around the circular playing track and bring them safely home to the finish area. The thing that made this game the most fun was the pop -o matic cube shaker in the middle of the board. Each player presses the pop -o matic and the highest number starts. The key number is six. Each time a player has his turn, he's entitled to one pop and move. Each time a six shows up, he's entitled to an additional pop and then move. A player must pop a six before he can move the man out of the home base and into the starting circle. In the course of the game, each player tries to send his opponents back to their home bases. The Game of Trouble is still manufactured and available today, although it looks quite a bit different than it did in the 1960s. I sure hope you enjoyed this walk with me down memory lane as I relived a lot of my childhood toy memories from the 1960s and 1970s. Now if you enjoyed them too, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and thanks for watching Allie Picked.